on to the top 50 programs in college football for 2023. Right here at the Voice of College Football, leave those comments down below. We are running through every program in college football, 133 all the way up to number one. We've reached the top 50. And again, this is a program ranking for 2023. This is not an all-time ranking. This is not a team ranking for 2023. Okay, this is all about the program. Who's the head coach? What are the facilities, the resources, the recruiting, the brand, the tradition? Yes, the 2022 team and how it transitions to 2023 as well. Yes, put it all together. And these are the program rankings right here at the Voice of College Football. Leave your comments below. At number 50, BYU and Kalani Sataki. It's 56 and 34, coming off an 8 and 5 season. Of course, they somewhat exploded onto the scene and took a shot at a possible college football playoff appearance in that strange COVID year of 2020, which uh, everyone, especially BYU, patched together a schedule. All right, they play with a lot of older players because of the Mormon missions, and now they finally play in the Power Five. I rank and rate and evaluate the schedules in college football every offseason, and I always say this about BYU. They play the strangest schedule in college football because in that first month, they are loaded. They play a brutal, daunting schedule, mostly against the Pac-12 powers. But then after that, they struggle to find teams to play. Well, no longer. They are a member of the Big 12. It's going to be very intriguing to see how BYU does there in the Big 12. Our number 50 program in college football, BYU. At number 49, we stay in the Big 12 with a program that has succeeded at a much higher level than this uh, throughout its history. Uh, I think most college football fans are surprised when they learn that this is a top 15 program in terms of all-time wins. Uh, look at the NFL players produced. Look at the bowl victories. Look at the success back in the Big East. But that success has not come easily or often for West Virginia in recent years. And now Neil Brown's in his fifth season, and he needs to produce. He's 22-25, and 25, coming off another 5-7 and seven season. This used to be, again, a top 10 program at times in college football. They've got recruiting challenges, and now they face an expanded Big 12. Coming off 5-7, and seven, our number 49 program in all college football is West Virginia. 11 seasons ago, they transitioned from the Big 12, where they were often frequently contenders in that conference to the SEC. And despite winning two SEC division championships in their second and third years under Gary Pinkle, we are now seeing where Missouri stands in the SEC. They're one of the two or three or four worst programs in the conference. Eli Drinkwitz was just given a contract extension. Compare his work to Barry Odom. I'm not seeing a difference. Barry Odom was shown the door they're underachieving at Mizzou. They're coming off another 6-7 and seven season. That's a second consecutive bowl loss to finish under 500. Yes, it's tough to win. It's tough to recruit. They, after Vanderbilt, typically have the worst recruiting class in the conference. They need to find a quarterback. They've got a five-man battle going on right now. Our number 48 team in college football, our number 48 program in college football, Missouri. Did I say underachieving? At Mizzou, now we go to classic overachievement. Dave Clawson, what a job he has done at Wake Forest. Wake Forest was winning three and four football games before Dave Clawson got it going. And it took him a while, of course. He's still only recruiting in the 50 to 60 range nationally. But he's 53 and 35 since 2016. They went to the ACC championship game with Sam Hartman, of course, at quarterback two seasons ago against Pitt. Dave Clawson do a doing a heck of a job at Wake Forest. However, with the recent news coming out about the ACC 7, speculation about the grant of rights and those teams, those schools' ability to break from it, where does this leave Wake Forest's future? But for right now, they've got the most underpaid coach in college football. They've got limitations all over the place, classic developmental program, and they work it to the hilt. The number 47 program in college football, Wake Forest. What Mike Leach accomplished at Texas Tech is still remarkable. Check out the coaches prior to and those that succeeded Mike Leach. They did not get it done at the level that Mike Leach did. Consider, what is your current thought about Texas Tech football? And then consider, 
Mike Leach finished in the top 25 five of his last six seasons. Do you think of Texas Tech as being a perennial top 25 program? Well, they were under Mike Leach. Now they have some hope under Joey McGuire. Coming off a first initial uh, splash here in 2022, excellent season. They played strong against NC State at a conference. They played well in the Big 12 with five wins in the conference. Finished off with a dismantling of a talented Ole Miss team in the Texas Bowl. Joey McGuire, I didn't understand the hire as a head coach. Not that I had anything personally against him. Just didn't see it as a Baylor linebacker coach that he would be a power five head coach. But hey, he is doing the job in the middle of nowhere. Difficult to get players to Lubbock, Texas. Expanded conference. There are challenges there, but Joey McGuire off to a great start and the number 46 program in college football, Texas Tech. I was just reviewing an article posted in The Athletic that was discussing Big Ten recruiting and uh, interviews involving eight of the most prominent high school football coaches in the Midwest, and there were high grades given to one Ryan Walters, first-year head coach at Purdue. We go to the Boilers. They, of course, are missing Jeff Brom, who moves on to Louisville. Brom lifted this program significantly. Uh, of course, we know the work that Joe Tiller did there. Drew Brees, a great passing offense. They perennial went to bowl games. They went to a Rose Bowl even in 2000. Purdue usually won about eight games under Joe Tiller. And then they took uh, just a monumental decline under the likes of Danny Hope and Daryl Hazel. To the rescue was Jeff Brom. After going on a 3-30 and run in the Big Ten, Jeff Brom did great things there. Brought defense, actually, and of course, one of the better play callers and uh, offensive minds in all of college football. So after the Jeff Brom turnaround, can Ryan Walters pick that up? He uh, put together a remarkable defensive showing at Illinois this past season with a lot of future NFL players. Was he uh, blessed with those NFL players or did he develop them? And now they've got to pick up on the passing attack that now misses Aiden O'Connell. Interesting situation there at Purdue with a new head coach in Ryan Walters. And we call the Boilers our number 45 program in all of college football. Baylor is riding the roller coaster with Dave Aranda as the head coach. Of course, he took over uh, for Matt Rule, who did wonders after the situation there left to him. Went from 111 to a Big 12 championship game just a few years later and 11 wins. Then Dave Aranda takes over. He's got to work through the COVID year in his first season, which is difficult for any first-year head coach to have faced that challenge. Then he wins the Big 12 championship, wins the Sugar Bowl. They fall back down to 6-7, and seven, including a bowl loss to Air Force. They win with defense. He's a defensive mastermind. They need to find a quarterback again. They're a funny program there in Waco, Texas. Baylor coming off 6-7, and 20-16 and 16 under Dave Aranda, our number 44 program in all of college football. From probably the worst program in the Power 5 to one of the best teams in the Pac-12. What a job turned in by one Jonathan Smith at his alma mater at Oregon State. The Beavers coming off a 10-3 season, a bowl victory over Florida, top 15 finish. Who would have thought that was possible just a few years ago as Jonathan Smith inherited again? By the metrics, by the production rate, by the S&P Plus, we were looking at one of the worst rosters in college football over the past 20 or 25 years when Jonathan Smith took over. What a turnaround. And, of course, it was culminated this past season with a nine-win regular season and a bowl victory in which they didn't really have good quarterback play. And he still pulled that off. Okay, now he gets to develop DJ Uyangalele and to see whether they can truly compete at the top of the Pac-12. The conference situation long-term is in doubt. Oregon State obviously has recruiting limitations, and it's just a one-season uh, run that we've seen. So more proof of concept has to be delivered by Jonathan Smith, but what a remarkable job he has done. Our number 43 program in college football, the Beavs. I'm a believer in Brett Bielema. He took over for the legendary Barry Alvarez, kept it rolling at Wisconsin with three consecutive Rose Bowl trips and Big Ten championships. He moved to Arkansas. We could debate uh, what he produced there. Uh, In the end, it was a 4-8 season that uh, showed him to the door. He gets some NFL experience. He comes back. He learns from guys like Bill Belichick. 
and he takes over at Illinois, and they are immediately better in 2021. Five wins, defeated teams like Penn State and Nebraska and Minnesota, and then they get an eight-win season that should have been so much better as they blew some games down the stretch and took Michigan to the wire, played Michigan better than anyone in the Big Ten. Illinois, though, loses a lot of NFL talent. Boy, the secondary ravaged Chase Brown at running back. They lose their starting quarterback, Tommy DeVito. Luke Altmeyer steps in from Ole Miss where he received some experience. They were better than their record last season. I'm concerned about the recruiting there at Illinois. Brett Bielema still bringing in bottom two to three classes in the Big Ten. That has been an issue there. This Illinois program has not won for a long, long time. Ron Zook had the one big season in 2007 to the Rose Bowl. This is not the program of the 80s and 90s. Brett Bielema is trying to spark the fan base, bring the alumni back, uh, get champagne rocking again. It's been a long, long time at Illinois, but certainly great start in 2021 and 22. Our number 42 program in college football, the Fighting Illini. Don't we all want to see what Jeff Brom can get accomplished at Louisville? Scott Satterfield took over after an impressive run that he had at App State. He was a hotshot newcomer, up-and-coming coach, gets the big Power 5 job in the ACC, takes over for the disaster that Bobby Petrino left and was, takes a 2-10 and football program, gets a bowl win over Mississippi State to finish 8-5. and Then after that, big expectations and never delivered. A lot of barely bowl seasons, four and seven in the COVID year, six and seven, did finish off at eight and five, but Louisville can do better. And Jeff Brom's probably the guy to get it done. He comes back home, a lot of incentive, takes over his alma mater. Of course, he played quarterback there. Jeff Brom can work an offense and he can develop quarterbacks. And I think this is a good fit. Louisville and Jeff Brom at number 41 in our program rankings. At number 40, we go to the model. They are the standard for group of five excellence. Not talking about Cincinnati, not talking about Houston, UCF, Fresno State, San Diego State. No, talking about Boise State. Of course, Boise State and the Blue Turf have become legendary. This is the group of five program that was the original giant killer. And you know when you've got a good program is when you can go from coach to coach to coach to coach. And it seems as though it doesn't matter who the coach is, the program continues to roll on. But that's not it. The program rolls on because, yes, the coaching's excellent and the program's been established. But then they actually go out and hire the next excellent coach. Coach after coach after coach after coach. Look through the last 20 to 25 years of Boise State football the best winning percentage in college football at 83% this century. All right, of course, they play in the group of five, so that's a statistic that has to be taken into consideration. But this was the blueprint, the blue standard, and the blue turf before anyone else. Andy Avalos is the latest. He got off to a bit of a rough start, but he's 17-9, and nine, coming off a 10-4 and four finish this past year. They have few advantages. They don't have football players in Idaho. They're in the middle of nowhere. They don't have a TV market. They don't have the type of school institution that's going to lure itself uh, to other major conferences. But despite it all, they develop football players and put it all together. It's one heck of a football program. At number 40 in our rankings, Boise State. They've got the alumni base. They've got a proven head coach. They play in a major market. They play in a potentially major NIL market, and they play in arguably the best high school football playing state in America, and they're a newcomer to the Power Five. At number 39 in our rankings, UCF coming off a 9-5 and five season in which they reached the conference championship game. Gus Malzahn, of course, had his two big seasons at Auburn, the rest of the time about 8-5 and five there, comes to UCF and unleashes his offense, and UCF's got it going. Now they take their shot at the Big 12. Malzahn at 18-9 and nine during his stay at Central Florida. Our number 39 program in college football is UCF. I have not been the biggest fan of Mike Loxley. Why did Maryland hire him? They have a Big 10 program. It's not a great program, but it's a respected program that has won through the years at various times in the 80s, early 2000s, And they hire this coach 
that at New Mexico was 2-26. And, and he had two off-field issues. But he went to the Nick Saban Rehabilitation Program for Wayward Coaches. And it must have done wonders for one Mike Loxley. Got off to a bit of a rough start at uh, Maryland, taking over D for DJ Durkin and the controversy that ensued there. But now he's got it going. He's 21-28 and 28 at Maryland. But hey, 15-11 and 11 the last two years, including 8-5. and five. He's posted the first winning season at Maryland since 2010, the first bowl victory since 2014. They've won two consecutive bowl games against ACC opponents this past season against a pretty darn good NC State team. They can recruit there. They've got the DMV. It's a pretty good setup there for Maryland. Unfortunately, they've got to knock heads with Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State every year. We'll see what the new scheduling format in the Big Ten has in store for Maryland, our number 38 program in all of college football. At number 37 in our program rankings, we go to another coach who has been much maligned by me in the past. Look at Dave Doran's record at NC State. Okay, it looks pretty good on the surface. However, look at his first eight seasons. And I have produced videos here to say, why is Dave Doran still employed in Raleigh? Because he was winning 35% of his games in the ACC. Now, it looked good on the surface because he was beating up bad non-conference schedules, getting to bowl games, and getting his share of wins in the bowl games. So the overall record, not bad at that point. But yes, 35% winning percentage. Getting better, though. Getting better. His last few seasons have been much better. 8-4, 9-3, 8-5 with a bowl loss to Maryland this past season. He's 72-54 and 54 overall. He's been there for a long, long time. There are a few coaches across America that have been at a Power 5 school as long as Dave Doran has. But when has he won a meaningful game? I'm waiting. His record against ranked opponents is awful. Dave Doran, do better. You are doing slightly better in recent years. Do better. You're part of the ACC 7, so there might be some life uh, past the ACC for this NC State program, whether Dave Doran's there or not. For right now, it's our number 37 program in college football. Look at this at number 36. We stay right in the same state. We go to the arch rival, and we look up one Mac Brown in North Carolina. Coming off a 9-5 and five season and trip to the ACC championship game, and for North Carolina to get to a conference championship game, that seems like an excellent season, right? Drake May at quarterback, potential Heisman winner, candidate from last season with 45 touchdowns. That all looks good on the surface, explosive offense. But my goodness, they were 8-1 and one at one point in this season, and they just tanked against some marginal teams. They got blown out by 29 points, and Clemson didn't really beat anybody that good outside of Florida State the rest of the season. So this was a marginal football team that had some flash that looked good against the likes of a awful division. Almost pulled off an upset in the Holiday Bowl against Oregon. So where does North Carolina football stand right now? Well, they got to find some defense. They got Gene Chizik in to orchestrate the defense, and they were awful early. They got marginal later in the season. Mac Brown came in, and I got to say, a lot of people questioned that hire, including myself to a certain extent. I didn't ridicule it, but I just said, I don't know that you necessarily want to go after a guy that's on the downside. But look at Mac Brown and his career. You got to credit not just the national championship at Texas, but you got to credit how much better North Carolina was the first stint with Mac Brown versus where they were before and after Mac Brown. Same with Texas. Before Mac Brown, after Mac Brown. Same now with North Carolina during the second stay prior to Mac Brown with Larry Fedora. He makes programs better. How much better, though? It looked like the leap was going to be dramatic in that 2020 season. They went to an Orange Bowl. They did Sam Howlett quarterback. They went from a two win football team to a seven win team. But now they've somewhat stagnated. The defense has to get better. The recruiting says that the defense should be better. 
All right, 30 and 22 is Mac Brown at North Carolina, the number 36 program in all of college football. We continue with our mid-Atlantic Southern theme here with the Carolinas and now South Carolina, the Gamecocks. I have always said this about South Carolina football. This might be the most underachieving program in college football. Why? I'm not talking about the last 10 or 15 years. I'm not talking about Texas underachieving during that time. I'm talking about all time. Oregon State doesn't have football players, and they don't have support. I'm talking long-term, folks, not talking about right now. Uh, you can look at other down programs throughout history, Kansas, Rutgers, etc., Northwestern back in the day, Vandy, difficult academic standards. There's a reason why those programs are down. South Carolina, great recruiting footprint. They're in the Deep South, rabid fan base. They fill the stadium. They throw money and resources at that program. Why don't they win more? Well, maybe they've got the guy here in Shane Beamer. Uh, really, the zenith of this program was under Steve Spurrier, winning 11 games three consecutive seasons about a decade ago. Will Muschamp was not the guy. Shane Beamer looks to be that guy. The recruiting has been so much better. Of course, they stare up at Tennessee and mostly Georgia in that division. Beamer's at 15 and 11 in his two seasons, including eight and five this past season. With the 12 team college football playoff, there is some life, some hope, some optimism for this program getting to postseason play and playing meaningful games. Of course, they finally got a win against Clemson for the first time in forever. Our number 35 program in college football, South Carolina. Like those other mid-tier programs that find themselves in the SEC Western Division, Mississippi State's in a tough spot. But you can win there. Uh, I was covering Mississippi State football on a daily basis back in the late 1990s. Jackie Sherrill had taken over a bad football program, and he did what he did at Pitt and Texas A&M as well. He lifted them to contending status. They actually went to an SEC championship game in 1998. Dan Mullen after five, six, seven, eight down seasons lifted Mississippi State uh, to, of course, that infamous uh, answer to the trivia question as the first ever college football playoff number one team in the rankings in 2014. Uh, Dan Mullen had a nice run. And now it's Mike Leach, of course. May he rest in peace. And it was so much fun to watch Mike Leach go to the SEC and unleash his air raid attack courtesy Will Rogers, who, if he has a ordinary season, Will Rogers this year, let's say 3,500 yards, 35, 40 touchdown passes, is going to be one of the top 10 most prolific passers in the history of college football. We've got this big transition, though, from Mike Leach and the air raid to a more conventional approach on offense with former defensive coordinator Zach Arnett. But looking at the overall look of the program and what it's been, you can win there. And when I mean win, not championships, you can win bowl games. You can go eight and four on a fairly regular basis at Mississippi State. They love their football there. They've got f good football players in the state, maybe just not enough of them. They're coming off nine and four under Mike Leach. Now it's a new era in Starkville. Our number 34 program in college football, Hale State. Wave goodbye to the ACC Coastal Division and wave goodbye programs to an easy entry to the ACC championship game. The team that did it two years ago and the most successful of the Coastal Division teams, not Miami, it's been Pitt. Pat Narduzzi's done a nice job there with the Pitt Panthers. Uh, they have enjoyed their most success for this proud, proud program with a long list of great NFL players and a Heisman Trophy, of course, in Tony Dorsett and national championships from the past. This is their best success since the late 1980, 62 and 41 for Pat Narduzzi. They won the ACC, of course, two years ago. They're coming off a nine and four season and a nice Sun Bowl victory against UCLA. Pat Narduzzi, if nothing else, knows how to coach defense and especially defensive line play. They've recruited well there uh, and schemed it up to the point that they have finished in the top three or four in the nation in sacks five or six consecutive years. It's a different kind of program. They play in an NFL stadium. What will happen with realignment, possible expansion, possible breakup of the ACC? Could Pitt be left out? I don't think so. They'll find a landing spot. Good uh, institution, good football program, good tradition, 
and all of that. Our number 33 program in all of college football, Pitt. There's a handful of programs in college football that I find intriguing. This is one of them. They're a perennial power of sorts. This is going to surprise some people, and they'll push back on this comment. But if you grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you looked at this program as a Southwest Conference power that moved to the SEC, and it might surprise some people that haven't been around watching college football for more than five or ten years that they've appeared in, let's see, three SEC championship games. Talking about Arkansas, of course. My goodness, Chad Morris can't coach, apparently. He did a nice job at SMU, but how do you take over an Arkansas program and lose to the teams that he lost to and lose all? All your games for two consecutive SEC seasons. Okay, that's in the past. Sam Pittman takes over as a first-time head coach and an offensive line coach, not even a coordinator at Georgia. And what a job Sam Pittman's done. Now, he might be facing his first adversity, though, in Fayetteville. It's been all step up until last season. 9-4 and four two years ago with a nice bowl win against Penn State and a top 15 finish. Last year, however... Uh, Faced a lot of injuries, porous defensive play, and uh, they lost six games. Almost blew a mammoth lead in the Liberty Bowl against Kansas, hung on 55-53. They do have K.J. Jefferson back, arguably the best quarterback in the SEC. Interesting program again. 19-17 and is Sam Pittman's record, but man, he took over a disaster and now they're in line to see if they can break through in the SEC Western Division. We'll see what the new realigned uh, format, scheduling format, and division format looks like for Arkansas, whether they can buy a break after years and years of slogging it against Bama, LSU, and Texas A&M and those powers in the SEC Western Division. Wasn't that too long ago that uh, Bobby Petrino landed them in major bowls. You can win there. Coming off 7-6, and six, the number 32 program in college football. Ooh. Peak suey! I hear very few college football fans these days that have much confidence in Mel Tucker. That's a far cry from what we heard this time last year after 11-2 top 10 finish Peach Bowl victory. But he's lost his starting quarterback in Peyton Thorne, lost his best wide receiver and playmaker in Keon Coleman, and, of course, they're coming off a five-win season in which, at times, they looked worse than that. Mel Tucker's got a big contract, big payday, tough division, tough opponents, blue-collar program that was built by Mark D'Antonio. Mel Tucker took it over, and he's 18-14, and 14, but coming off again, 5-7 and seven with Noah Kim, an inexperienced quarterback. There are questions to be answered at Michigan State. They get the support. But again, the schedule is daunting and the challengers daunting in terms of rivals, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. Our number 31 program in college football, Sparty. This may be the first program that we've reviewed where an overwhelming tradition meets the here and now. We go to Lincoln, Nebraska with a hundred zillion consecutive sellouts. They are supported. It could be argued, unlike any other program in college football. It's amazing. You know how bad they've been? What was Scott Frost's record? Off the top of my head, like 15 and 30? Awful. They have been terrible. They are the only program in the Power Five that has not been to a bowl game since 2016. Rutgers has, Wake has, Vandy has, Illinois, Oregon State. Everybody has. Colorado has. Everybody, not Nebraska. That's how bad it's been under Scott Frost. He was supposed to be the perfect hire. I don't know anybody who did not pat Nebraska on the back and say, that's the favorite son, that's the guy. He just went 12-0 and at UCF, but it was a disaster. Okay, we move on. We go to Matt Rule. Matt Rule should not be a disaster. Look at what he did at Temple, turned them around. He had Temple in a conference championship game. Baylor led them to a conference championship game just a couple of years after going 1-11 and and following that controversy. So Nebraska looks in position. They've got the facilities, the brand name, the tradition. They love football and they will do anything possible to win. The recruiting situation isn't the best. They've got a good NIL collective in play. 
uh, to compete. However, of course, there aren't enough football players in that part of the country. That's the big challenge for Matt Rule in Nebraska. Our number 30 program in college football, top five to 10 all time. But right now in the here and now, based on the results, they've been more like top 75. Put it all together, looking ahead with a good head coach, number 30 program in college football, GBR. The most underachieving program in college football over the last 15 years is Texas. But Miami's got something to say about it. At number 29 in our rankings, coming off a 5-7 and seven season, the Canes. All right. From 1980 to 2002 or 3, this was one of the great programs in college football. We know that. We know that they did nothing prior to 1980, and then they just... Boom. Howard Schnellenberger should have a statue outside the stadium. He should be in the College Football Hall of Fame. They've got their idiotic rules uh, about winning percentage. But Howard Schnellenberger, what he did at Miami is truly remarkable. Okay, then he set it up for the next few decades. They took advantage, and they were the U. Then they faltered in the mid-2000s. This program has won 55% of its games in the last 15 years. 55% of its games. If I told you the programs that have a better winning percentage than Miami, you might be astounded. Kansas State, Georgia Tech. I did a video on this a, a few years ago. It's astounding. Okay, we're in the here and now. Mario Cristobal, I believe he's a good head coach. I have my doubts about certain things regarding uh, game preparation, game management, but in regards to recruiting, building a program, developing quarterback development could be an issue, but he did a nice job at Oregon. We know that he did, and he left it in a good place for Dan Lanning. My problem here is that he takes over this, uh, and I know he's in a rebuild mode, but really good head football coaches don't normally tank the first season. They usually, especially when they're given a good roster, and they were awful last year. You know, Texas A&M went 5-7, and seven, but they were in every game the entire season in the SEC. Miami was just awful, getting blown out by Duke and Middle Tennessee, and on and on and on. Where does it go from here? Again, they're recruiting their tails off. They're in South Florida. They will have a landing spot regardless of what happens to the ACC. They're a brand that is going to get scarfed up by somebody. The Big Ten, the SEC, they're in a good position. But, man, we've been saying this for a long, long time. When is Miami going to win? The number 29 program in college football, the U. Now let's go to the anti-Miami in regards to climate and expectations and performance and results. P.J. Fleck doing the job at Minnesota. Consider in his last three regular seasons, full seasons, Minnesota's 29 and 10, 11 and 2, 9 and 4, 9 and 4. Add it up. P.J. Fleck's getting the job done. He got the job done at Western Michigan. Western Michigan undefeated going to a Cotton Bowl. Are you kidding me? Then he goes to Minnesota. He has a rough first season, but he makes the right moves. Fires the defensive coordinator, Joe Smith. Moves on from there. They go on a five-game winning streak, win the bowl game, and they've been a good program ever since, 44-27. and Now he's got to win big games in division, and they only have one more shot to win the division, of course, with the changing format in the Big Ten. Difficult place to get players, obviously. Not a whole lot of players in Minnesota or the surrounding states. That's a difficult draw for him. Uh, but in regards to what he has to work with and this program that has a proud, proud tradition, including a national championship in 1960, our number 28 program in college football, row the boat. Many of us had given up on one Chip Kelly I don't know that he gets enough credit for the remarkable run at Oregon. They were a dominant, dominant elite program. 33-3 and in the Pac-12, going to national championship games, coming within one field goal of winning a national championship, and of course then uh, another championship game appearance after he left. Chip Kelly, remarkable at Oregon, got himself two NFL jobs, comes back to UCLA. I don't know what happened. It was almost like a Mario Cristobal kind of situation. Takes over a top 15 roster from Jim Mora and tanks 
year after year after year. Okay, the last two years, they've been a pretty darn good football team. Two years ago, not so much. In an eight and four season, smoke and mirrors, didn't beat anyone good. But this past team was a top, legit top 15 team in the nation. They lose their quarterback in Dorian Thompson Robinson. Dante Moore comes in, though. So a great get for a Chip Kelly uh, program that doesn't necessarily recruit as well as he should in Southern California. So gets his quarterback 18 and 8 the past two seasons. Now the move to the Big Ten. How will they transition? Will they pump money and resources, focus, attention, effort into winning big? He's only 27 and 29 at UCLA. But again, 18 wins in 26 games the past two seasons. Our number 27 program in college football. Consider the locale and the conference affiliation now, UCLA. I mentioned a few minutes ago when covering the Mississippi State ranking that I covered that football program for seven years, day after day after day after day. I mean, going to practices, news conferences, going on all the bowl trips, getting on the air, the whole deal. Same thing with Ole Miss. Uh, Intriguing program. I love the contrast between the two Egg Bowl rivals. And uh, Ole Miss now has Lane Kiffin, of course, one of the most talked about coaches in college football. Highly regarded for his playmaking, his play calling, his scheming, and his confidence and his ability to draw young men to the program. Interesting, though, that they really tanked at the end of last year. They started 7-0. They were 8-1 with one loss to Bama in a close game, so credit that effort. Then they just tanked after that. LSU blew them out after a 17-3 lead. Uh, the, The bowl game was a debacle. They looked awful against Texas Tech as a big favorite. But Lane Kiffin has turned down Auburn to stay at Ole Miss. Now with a 12-team playoff, there is a possibility that Ole Miss, when things cycle up and they get some breaks, that they could reach a 12-team playoff. There should be hope and optimism that that's a possibility now in Oxford. At number 26 in our program rankings, Hotty Toddy. All right, everyone, we appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football. Leave your comments down below. Please, we need these videos to be shared out there. We need them to blow up. We need people to watch these. These are smart videos for smart college football fans like you. So let's get them out there, and we will have a live stream. Once we go through all the rankings, we're going to have a live stream. We'll take your calls or your comments, your questions, and we will dice it up, as we always do. Best discussion, debate, and analysis right here at the Voice of College Football.